Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Dunstan Thomas's live webinar, Shaping Income in Retirement. My name's Adrian Bolding. I'm the Director of Retirement Strategy at Dunstan Thomas, and I will be chair for today's webinar, which will be running live until one o'clock, where we aim for a prompt finish. We have three fabulous speakers for you today. And we'll be taking questions and answers at the end after they've each delivered their three short presentations. There is an ask a question box at the bottom. So please enter your questions in there as we are going along. And also, um, you know, you can vote for the questions that you would most like to have answered in that box. Um, it is, as you know, a series of um, you know webinars that we do, and there is a little box at the bottom, which is there at the moment. It'll appear later on again in the show, enabling you to sign up straight away for our next webinar, which is the part two of SAS Market Review, and that will be held on Thursday, 24th of June at 12 o'clock. The three speakers that we have for you today, we have Jessica List. Jessica has been with Curtis Banks for nine years as pensions technical manager. She focuses on helping advisors with queries and writing technical content for Curtis Banks and Trade Press. Amongst the items that Jessica will cover today is how pension freedoms also transformed the death benefits landscape for DC pensions. And Jessica will consider how these rules may affect clients retirement planning we also have barry foster barry is the newly appointed technical sales manager at curtis banks with nearly 25 years in financial services barry has held similar roles at axa wealth and utmost wealth solutions today barry will consider how diversifying investments across various tax wrappers can provide tax efficiencies in retirement and we have Peter Ellis. After spending 12 years managing Just's annuity proposition, in 2018, Peter took up a role leading Spire Platform Solutions, which was established to provide a wider range of solutions to be made available via investment platforms and SIPs. Today, Peter will talk about the benefits of blending decumulation options and will cover topics such as the importance of moving from deterministic to stochastic modeling, calculating essential income needs in retirement and annuitizing to provide that baseline income. But first, just a few words from me. Every year, three quarters of a million people reach retirement age and begin what we euphemistically call the longest holiday of their lives. Only for some, it will turn into the longest nightmare as they live in fear of ever-increasing bills outstripping their retirement income and find that they are forced to turn to their own children and grandchildren for support when they so wanted retirement to be different. But this is not a day for looking back and saying that they should have saved more. For those on the cusp of retirement, that's in the past, and the past is now behind them. It's like, well, Every Ferrari driver knows the first law of Italian driving. What's behind me is not my concern. Today, we will look at what a little careful financial management can do to help people through the maze of retirement options. As is often the case in finance, we can do most for the people who have most money. That's why IFAs are all congregating at the top end of the wealth spectrum because it's up here that people's financial lives really get complicated and where a well thought through plan carefully executed can deliver savings of many times the advisory fees involved. This is a difficult place for product providers to play in. They suffer from Donald Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns. They know what people have saved with them and try and create a decumulation product to cater for that, but it's only a piece of the picture, as typically people have five or six unconsolidated pension pots today. Those are the known unknowns, and maybe the product provider can offer a consolidation service and help the customer bring bits and pieces of pension together into one decumulation product. But 
the study of Generation X that Dunstan Thomas conducted last year, which is still available on our downloads page, revealed that Generation X are increasingly thinking in terms of building a patchwork quilt of retirement income sources. Their income is going to be coming from pensions, from buy-to-let investments, from ISAs, perhaps from selling up their own business, and even from equity currently locked into their own home. Many of these are complete unknown unknowns for the pension product provider. The situation is especially difficult for workplace pension providers. The old model of women didn't go to work and a man's workplace pension had to provide both for him and something for her indoors after he'd passed on is so last century that I can almost be shot for even mentioning it. Today, we aim for gender equality in pay and pensions. Two thirds of pensioners live as couples, but the workplace DC pension has the same contribution for single employees, for married employees, and even for divorced and remarried employees, where they may be supporting three adults on one workplace pension. Today, FCA estimates that one in 10 adults have access to financial advice. This is the group that we will devote much of today's webinar to, and quite rightly so. The thing that has moved IFAs from being salesmen pre-RDR to being first and foremost advisors today is their ability to take a helicopter view of the client situation and then to direct affairs accordingly. So you will hear from speakers today who don't assume the pensioner has all their eggs in one basket but instead recognize that today's retiree combines different income generating assets and needs help on how to build a portfolio and in what order to draw it down. Of course, the fundamental need in retirement is income. The pensioner needs to generate an income from their savings in order to replace the regular income that they used to get from employment. In planning this income, the advisor will need to consider how the income required will change over time as the pensioner moves through retirement. Will it need to increase with inflation each year? And if so, is that RPI inflation or the lower CPI inflation? Opinions differ on the shape of retirement income requirements, but I'm in the camp of the retirement smile that believes that the income needed gently dips in the early years of retirement with falling activity levels and then gently rises in the later years as more assistance is needed like cleaners or gardeners. The graph of retirement income looks rather like the logo on a world famous internet shopping company. Now, to pick up the theme of disinvesting from different tax wrappers, I will pass over to Barry Foster, Technical Sales Manager at Curtis Banks. Thanks very much, Adrian. First challenge, make sure I can get my slides up. There we go. Hopefully you can see those. Are they visible? Yep, we are seeing those loud and clear now, Barry. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adrian. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so shaping uh, sh shaping income in retirement, the, the face or the, the, the landscape of retirement is obviously changing. People are retiring later, they're phasing into retirement, it's no longer a cliff-edged day when they suddenly stop working. And of course, um, we're seeing a, a demise in the DB uh, pension market, uh, pensions as well. And of course, people will have multiple tax wrappers. It's not just a pension, all of which I think is, is actually quite neatly summed up by the fact that we, as often as not, don't refer to it as retirement anymore. Uh, and, and, the, and the term decumulation is so often used because it more accurately reflects that phase in a person's life. From a tax wrapper perspective, um, I think for most of us, the ISA and the pension are the absolute foundation stone. But although this isn't absolutely not an exhaustive list, clients might also have a general investment account. They might have an investment bond and that might be an onshore bond or an offshore bond, for example. Um, 
in a moment, I'm going to look at a very, very high level, you know, highly simplified case study about how it's possible to use multiple tax wrappers in that decumulation phase in a highly tax efficient way. But before getting over excited about all sorts of different tax wrappers, I think it's worth reminding why the pensions are so effective and so efficient. So why do I think that alongside the ISA, the pension is essentially a foundation stone of a financial plan? So I'm going to use an example here, which is based on the relief at source tax relief method. If you're in a, an occupational scheme that's um, used the net pay structure, that the mechanisms are different, but the effect is the same. But relief at source, you, you've got a hundred pound contribution in the pension there, but how did it get there? Exceptionally, you may not be eligible for tax relief. So you may have made a gross contribution of a hundred pound, but more typically you will have made a net contribution of 80 pounds. And then the tax man adds the 20 pounds, giving you the gross contribution of 100. And if you're a higher or additional rate taxpayer, you go to the HMRC and you get some additional tax relief such that for a higher rate taxpayer, although they would have actually paid 80 pounds as a contribution, the overall effective net cost of that 100 pounds was 60 pounds or 55 pounds for an additional rate taxpayer. So that's tax relief. But of course, when you draw your benefits from a pension, you're going to pay tax on the benefits, but not all of them. So typically we're entitled to 25 percent tax free pension commencement lump sum and the other 75 percent in my example here, 75 pound tax taxable. Unless, of course, you can organise your affairs such that you're a non taxpayer, in which case the 100 pounds in the pension is 100 pound in your pocket. But again, more typically, Let's assume you're a basic rate taxpayer. When you draw your benefits, you will pay 20 percent tax, but only on the 75 pound, giving you therefore an effective a, a, a net benefit of 85 pound, 75, 70 pound if you're a higher rate taxpayer and circa 66 pound for an additional rate taxpayer. Another way of putting this is imagine I am a pension. If you are 55 years old today. You can give me 80 quid today and I can give you 85 quid back tomorrow. Why would you not do that? If you're a higher rate taxpayer today, but you're planning to retire next tax year and you expect to retire as a basic rate taxpayer, then at an effective net cost to you of only 60 quid today, I can give you 85 quid on April the 6th. So why would you not do that? So that to me sums up why pensions sit at the core at the heart of the financial plan. But thinking about alternative tax wrappers, again, highly simplified case studies, no numbers attached to this. It's just some, some concepts. It's not how you should do it, but it's how you could do it. An example, assume we have an individual decides to retire at 60. So they retire early before state pension kicks in. How do they replace their earned income? Well, we expect they'd have a pension that they could draw on and they may well have an ISA that they could draw on. Do they also have, for example, a general investment account? And perhaps in my example here, they've got an offshore investment bond. Perhaps now is the time to start taking profits from those tax wrappers. We're in a period where we have no earned income and we do not yet have state pension income. So. The general investment account will produce income, dividends, savings income, property income, distributions, etc., all of which are taxable. Now, at this phase, with no other income, we can set our personal allowance, our starting rate band, our personal savings allowance, our dividend allowances, all against that naturally arising but taxable income. But when the state pension kicks in, we're going to have fewer allowances to set against that taxable income. So is now the time to start making withdrawals, taking capital, reducing that general investment account such that it produces less in the way of taxable income in the future. And so long as when we make those capital withdrawals, the gains, the profits sit within our annual exemption, we can make those withdrawals free from tax. What about an offshore bond in this period between ending earned, uh, earned income and before starting state pension? Gains or profits from an offshore bond are taxed as savings income. So to the extent they're available, 
The gains from an offshore bond can be set against your personal allowance, your starting rate bound for savings and your personal savings allowance. So you could, in theory, make profits or chargeable event gains of up to £18,700. Profit, not withdrawals, but profit before you have a liability to tax. So we've had effectively tax free growth on this offshore investment bond in the accumulation phase. And now we can make withdrawals in the decumulation phase and avoid tax in that phase as well. Perhaps we now get the state pension age, the state pension kicks in and takes up a substantial proportion of the personal allowance. Well, that further drives the motive perhaps to reduce the GIA, continue to make capital withdrawals because you've got less personal allowance and therefore more taxable income, potentially more tax. We reduce down the GIA, keeping the gains within the CGT annual exemption, continue to make withdrawals tax exempt. Is there an onshore bond in the portfolio? And perhaps now might be the time to start taking profit from the onshore bond. Just like the offshore bond, profits or chargeable event gains are taxed as savings income. So to the extent that there's any left, we can set our personal allowance against the gains. We can set our starting rate bound for savings and our personal savings allowance against the gains as well. But of course, what's interesting about an onshore investment bond is that having suffered corporation tax in the accumulation phase, when you realise chargeable event gains, when you surrender the bond or pot segments of the bond, you get a basic rate tax credit. Which means that to the extent that the gain sits within the basic rate band and factor in top slice relief as well, of course, there's no further liability to tax. So although it might seem perhaps a bit like gilding the lily, uh, I, I could argue that for an in onshore investment bonds, the basic rate tax band is effectively another nil rate band. We get to later life and perhaps the focus now shifts towards estate planning, inheritance tax planning, intergenerational planning. And actually, the focus now is on perhaps reducing the size of the estate. If you still have the GIA, you can give it away. Now, of course, that could give rise to a capital gains tax liability as a disposal, unless, of course, it's a gift into trust, in which case you might have holdover relief. If you've still got your investment bonds, well, of course, you can assign those to your children, your grandchildren, or again, indeed, into trust. And as long as the assignment is not for money's worth, there's no tax liability on that transfer of ownership. But if you're looking at estate or inheritance tax planning and it's going to involve trust planning, firstly, that's likely to include quite high ticket value uh, cases, so a, a lot of money, and it might be better, more flexible to give the trustees cash rather than a legacy investment. But how do you access substantial amounts of cash in a highly tax efficient way? Well, that's where perhaps the ISA kicks in. You can make withdrawals of any amount from your ISA tax exempt. Perhaps that's the place from which your trust planning is funded. And again, throughout the entire period from 60 through to death, you may well be also drawing funds from the pension. And if you're drawing pension commencement lump sum, you may be taking benefits from your pension, but without incurring a tax liability. To the extent that there's any fund left over on your death, then of course, the residual fund can be passed on in a highly flexible and tax efficient way to your beneficiaries, which is something I know that Jess will, will talk about later on. So a really quick, high level, highly simplified example of multiple tax wrappers won't apply to many of us. Most of us only need an ISA and a pension. But for those that have multiple tax wrappers, it's possible to, to create a highly tax efficient decumulation structure. That's Barry, me. thanks, thanks very much. That was a really useful canter through the complications that arise when the client's got many wrappers. Um, the reality, of course, is they will have been acquired at different times throughout their career. Some of them might have been advised on by previous advisors that have come from all sorts of different product providers. And I think it demonstrates the benefit of having an IFA that is able to look completely at your entire situation 
and uh, from the look of it, save you, you know, a fair packet in tax by doing so. It gives me great pleasure to move on and bring us to our, our second speaker, um, Peter Rallis. Hello there, Ben. Can you hear me? Hearing you loud and clear, Peter. Thank you. And hopefully you can see some slides. Is that working? They're down at the bottom of the screen, so we just need to make them large. And there they go. We are seeing your slides nice and clear. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you, Barry, for showing some complexity in there. I'm, I'm going to focus really in on the uh, on the pension world um, and look at some strategies that we might uh, deploy. Um, I hope. Hopefully you'll be able to see something now, which was typical approach that we see used in the market. Um, Multi-asset portfolio, you know, aligned to a, a, risk, a, a risk rating of the client. Um, cash flow modeling, increasing um, used these days. Um, some of the assumptions behind there can be a bit, bit rudimentary, but uh, we'll, we'll look at that. They're all developing. And the important point there is that there's lots of work going on at the minute, which uh, is developing these things. And, but plenty of them are doing you know, sort of individually, so diff different parts of the uh, ecosystem. The tech stack is, is, is bringing new things to new parts of the market. And I'm not sure that they're all joined up. So um, the challenge on those is, I suppose, looking at the performance of some of the fixed income lately. Um, I think there's alignment there with the uh, correlation of assets and, and performance. Big, big issue in retirement is uh, capacity for loss, and that's loss of income, um, often a more appropriate risk measure. And um, then, then we're looking at assumptions, and are, are indeed all the charges are they uh, are they fully taken into account in all of the modelling? So we're going to throw in a, a slightly different uh, idea, challenge some of that received wisdom, and uh, maybe throw in a few ideas. So a suggestion: we're, we're in the income phase, as, as Barry says, the decumulation. Well, and, and, and looking at, at income, how do we break that down? Uh, discretionary and non-discretionary, non-negotiable, as I would put it. Um, maybe we should be configuring assets allow, around that, that and, and looking at relative capacity for loss of each portion of income and then undertake um, modeling against each of those sort of subcomponents. Um, and they might have, probably do have, a, a slightly different um, capacity for loss. Can you, can, could you lose non-discretionary? Well, by, dis, uh, by definition, that, that you can't. Uh, but discretionary, that might be, might be a, put that in, in perhaps a higher category. So um, we've talked a lot about different um, asset allocations. We talk about low, medium, high, but what about no risk? Does anybody really think that we've got that? Well, sometimes cash is viewed, viewed as no risk, but that can be high risk because it just doesn't cover all your needs. So slightly different considerations. Um, a slightly different approach then. Perhaps use guaranteed lifetime income options um, because they will um address that life expectancy issue issue um often under underestimated those those as those contracts those those annuities let's use the, the a word um actually invest in the same assets as fixed income so there's no real difference in what they're investing in there's no magic in of money so the underlying investment returns are the same i mentioned earlier that they represent a non carolyn the asset. Um, and there's no sequence and volatility drag. So 
possibly, and I'm going to throw in a few things here, um, they can be the cheapest way of delivering non-discretionary income. And I'm going to do some comparisons for a 65-year-old requiring 5,000 a year of income, and that'll be obviously in addition to the state pension and anything else, and he wants to cover off the non-discretionary expense. Um, and I'll throw in here a, a product we have, which is uh, Secure Lifetime Income, which is an annuity contract. And to do that would cost him just over 100,000. Uh, the rate we thrown off is, is about 4.95%. Um, now, this is where it gets interesting. So what we're bringing in, uh, we, we use this casket model. And we look at asset returns over thousands of investment scenarios. Um, and we overlay, and this is where it's different, overlay life expectancy probabilities specific to that client. Um, and then we model the impact of withdrawing the monthly £416 a month and what happens to the portfolio. And importantly, this is where the numbers of the, uh, of the might blow our minds a bit, um, we determine the probability of all the model scenarios um, to selective survival probability. And that's where one in three, four people will be arrived, and, or one in 10. So just, just to be clear, 25% survival probability and a 10% survival probability as we look ahead. So I'm going to do these and we'll take the numbers slowly. So generating that 5,000 of, of non-discretionary expenditure. And as I said earlier, a guaranteed income solution would take just over 100,000 pounds. And the proportion of projections, which are still going when three in four have passed away, unfortunately, and one in four is left is 100%, obviously. It's lifetime income and similarly with the 10%. Uh, and here's where it gets into, interesting, because in a low risk rated portfolio, that same £100,950 has got only a 56% chance of arriving at the point when one in four people are still alive. I'll hold there. And then only a 44 percent chance of being at the point where still one in ten are still alive. If you move up the risk curve and use a moderate risk portfolio, those numbers change. And this is where it's interesting because in, in retirement income, going into two, two low risk assets, low yielding assets often hurts the situation. And the probabilities of success, if you like, are increased. Um, and that, that's a really, really interesting step. But I'd suggest those survival and those success probability are a little low. And I'd be perhaps more interested in maybe moving that up. I need that to be 90%. So if I need that to be 90%, what that means is I need 136,800. To, uh, to be invested, to deliver to that probability. And then if I'm more worried about the one in 10, so I need that to be 90%, I'm gonna need a hundred and, nearly 145,000 to be invested. And they look like safe-ish withdrawal. So they're at three, seven and three, five. So it's beginning to challenge some of that received wisdom of 4%. And dare I say, this isn't great. There's not heavy charges on, on this, and I can, I can send those around. So we've got a situation where, when, when I read the Daily Telegraph occasionally, um, and everybody tells me that the annuities are terrible, poor value, etc. I think they can be. When they're done in the context of a broader portfolio uh, and used in conjunction with more traditional investing assets, that's when I think they come into their, into their own. So, 
what I'd like to say is decumulation risks easily compound. If you get moderate or volatile returns, longer life expectancy, it really begins to hurt um, the chances of uh, successful outcomes. I mentioned it earlier, annuities invest in the same assets as, as bond funds often slightly, obviously they're held to duration, but they have their real-time yields. Um, delineating expenditure and hence income needs, I think is really important. It's where the FCAs seem to be going. Uh, it is often the cheapest way of covering off non-discretionary income. Um, and that's, that's, that's hard to get your head around because the, the, the belief generally is that that wouldn't be the case. And importantly, once you've covered that off and start building a portfolio for your discretionary income needs, it's much more freedom you can have. And perhaps we can start thinking about delivering better returns. So to sum up, maybe when used appropriately, annuity other and other guaranteed income aren't as bad a value at all. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening. If there's any questions, I'm sure I hear them. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We will take questions at the end of the session so please folks do stick your questions in the ask a question box i can see some people putting them in already and some people are voting on those questions so that's fabulous um as we move towards the later years of retirement which of course ultimately end in in death because all clients die at some point um we will move across to jessica our third presenter to talk us through some of those end of life issues. Jessica, over to you. Thank you. Everyone else has managed to share their slides and it's worked. So hopefully it will be three for three and mine will go as well. Yeah, looks like everything's up okay. Fabulous, thank you. So Peter and Barry have talked there around the different types of assets people might be looking at in terms of retirement income and also how clients might go about working out how much they need and what their income retirement needs actually are. So what I'd like to do just with my quick um, session here is really touch on, I suppose, a reminder more than anything else of the scope of some of the flexibility within those DC pensions. So Peter mentioned the fact that, of course, most of us will have some sort of uh, sort of baseline requirements uh, for income. And a lot of the time that will be met either potentially through uh, DB schemes or maybe by using some funds for an annuity. But if we are talking about that sort of full flexibility and how you can really use a pension to fit in with those other um, assets, those other sources, and how you can sort of build that and shape that retirement need, that flexibility is really looking at the DC world. So if you look at things like the FCA's Retirement Outcomes Review, uh, and maybe look at some of the statistics that HMRC releases around um, how people are using the pension freedoms, there is a particular, I suppose, pattern or model, however you'd like to, um, whatever you'd like to call it, that comes up time and time again. And it effectively shows that an awful lot of people will be saving into their DC product um, that they have during the accumulation phase, whether that's workplace or, or something else. And at some point when they reach retirement, they will simply transfer all of those funds into a different product, a new decumulation product, purely to immediately take out their tax free cash, crystallize the remaining funds in drawdown and leave them potentially for quite a long time before any income is actually taken. Now, from an individual's perspective, if during the working life they were pretty much expecting for there to be a day at which they make a decision to purchase an annuity with all of their funds and that would be it, then this looks pretty flexible. The idea of being able to take that tax free portion and, and do what you like with it and to not have to think about the rest for, I say, potentially a number of years might sound very attractive. Now, that's not to um, see, minimize in any way the potential issues in that area. So around people potentially not investing those funds properly or not really thinking about the product that they're in. But if you thought that you were just going to have to put an annuity in that, then this in itself looks pretty flexible. 
But the problem is that that only really scratches the surface of the flexibility that can be achieved within a DC pension and how that can fit into that wider retirement plan. So for instance, that sort of model overlooks things like regular and ad hoc UFPLS and partial and phase drawdown. Now, I appreciate UFPLS is a little bit of an odd one, not least because of the name, um, but just in the sense that it would usually primarily be in pensions that don't offer drawdown, so that there's still a way of, um, of having flexible access. But they are sometimes available from providers that offer drawdown as well. And depending on the person, depending on the situation, there might be good reasons to use one or the other. But generally speaking, these options around say, either taking uh, UFPLS in stages or only partially crystallizing are just around making more tax efficient use of a particular pension, primarily around spreading the tax free portion over a number of years. You know, for most people, taking all of their tax free funds from their pension on day one and then only being left with taxable funds from that pension for the rest of their retirement is probably not the most tax efficient use of the funds. Now, in that model that I mentioned before, if that is a world where that person has several smaller DC pensions and they are just doing that, um, that sort of model with one of those at a time, they might almost be doing this in a slightly different way. But if someone is doing that just with their only pension or having consolidated or from All right, Jessica seems to have frozen. Um, in fact, you're, you're back with us, Jessica. Oh. You froze for a moment, but you're you're back with us now. Okay, where did I freeze? Where should... <laughs> uh, uh, just just a few seconds ago. So I okay. would just just press on. Okay, so um, even if we're just talking about crystallized funds, just that ability to sort of keep stopping, starting, and changing income payments is, and uh, there's a huge scope within that as well. So again, I think if you read some of the sort of research that's coming out now and the surveys around what people think about pensions, how they're thinking about using them, even people where they have put funds in to draw down and they're thinking that they'll access the income at a later point, I think a lot are still thinking mainly along the lines of at some point I'll start taking income and that will be it. But being able to stop, start and change income, is it even annually or even more frequently as you're fitting into that wider piece as other investments become available or mature or as other income sources um, you know, become available or become the, uh, the more attractive proposition gives a lot of flexibility in and of itself. And the last point I always think it's worth mentioning in this area is just that ability to buy an annuity from drawdown funds as well. So, if someone buys an annuity and it turns out that actually they they could have benefited from the flexibility of drawdown, there's really nothing they can do. Whereas if someone has gone into drawdown and either their circumstances change or perhaps when they then come to advice um, for the first time, they realise that actually they do need that guaranteed income for at least some of their income needs. That is still possible, either from an entire drawdown fund or even from part of one. So, again, there's that ability or ongoing ability to continue shaping that DC pension and using it as um, as the uh, retirement draws on. So um, as, as I mentioned, of course, the other aspect with the pension freedoms is that it doesn't just open up the flexibility for planning for the client themselves. own retirement and of course making sure that they're in a product that will allow benefits planning first of all of course if their benefits are generally going to be tax-free for their beneficiaries but even post 75, normally now beneficiaries are only going to be looking at paying uh, income tax. So combined with the second major factor, which is the fact that beneficiaries can now, or any beneficiary can now potentially have the option of drawdown, that really opens things up. So even if you overlook the 
probably fair to say very few beneficiaries that might consider purchasing an annuity or maybe even a scheme pension, you end up with a scope for planning map that looks a little bit like this. So any beneficiary being able to go into beneficiaries drawdown and not only that, but when they pass away, their beneficiaries having the option of drawdown as well. Whereas previously, by the second death, it would almost always be paid out as a lump sum if there were any remaining funds. And the fact that you can have multiple beneficiaries at each stage helps as well. So you're in a world now where not only can the member plan tax efficiently around their expression of wishes, so perhaps strategically planning their beneficiaries to be um, tax efficient, but then when the beneficiary inherits the funds, if they do have that option of drawdown, they have then also now got a pension with very tax efficient options and a, a large scope for planning, not only managing the amount of tax they pay, but also fitting that into their wider portfolios as well. So all of this really just draws together, um, is it back to the points that the others were making, that you know retirement planning now, so there is an awful lot of flexibility there, but pension planning in particular goes beyond the life of the client as well. So there's an awful lot there to take into account. Hopefully I didn't freeze any more through the end of that. <laughs> and uh, I think Adrian's coming back on as well. Have I stopped? Jessica, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, you just froze a couple of times for a couple of seconds. That's all. But um, I think it was to do with the slide change that was eating up some bandwidth. So okay. I think with a bit of luck, um, you will be OK through the Q&A um, session. So what I will now do is move us into Q&A. And I can um, juxtapose the four of us on the screen together. And we've got folks, we've got um, just over a quarter of an hour for questions. There's still time to pop them up in the question box if you'd like to. And there's still time to vote, um, you know, on those all important questions. So we answer the ones that are most important to you, our audience. So I'm going to start right at the top of the pile. Um, seven votes for a question that says, if you are going to buy an annuity, is this better done at the start of retirement or later on at an older age? Um, who would like to take a pop? Uh, Peter, you're smiling. I'm going to come to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, would you think it's better for people to buy an annuity straight away when they retire or to wait a bit and buy it at an old, older age? What are the pros and cons? Let's there? get on the fence. Um, it depends. Of course, it depends. Um, um, I think the issue is where does state pension kick in and, and is that the start of retirement? I think you wouldn't want to sort of set up now and then suddenly get some state pension kicking in early. So I think it'll depend. Um, I think it helps earlier on because it helps you understand what you can do with the rest of the portfolio. And as you know, I keep, I keep talking about uh, a blend rather than, than A or B. I'm, I'm not saying buy an annuity with everything. And the other one is, what is old age? Um, I'm old enough to remember doing equivalent age. And when we look at somebody's life expectancy, somebody young with a short life ex expectancy may well be old in that context. So I'm afraid it's a depends. Thank you. Um, Jessica Barry, are you on the fence or do you have a particular a slant on whether it's better to buy an annuity earlier or, or later? On, on the fence, client specific, I think really. And I think that 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 key trigger is if it's early retirement pre-state pension, do you need to bridge that gap with an annuity or should you be actually bridging that gap with, with drawdown or other resources? So it is mm. kind of client specific, I guess, really. Not not the best, most helpful answer, but nothing better <laughs> than offer. That's brilliant. Yeah, okay. No, yep, Jess. No, I was going to say, I, I completely agree with the others. I think... Um, the only point you said is the fact that that draw isn't irreversible and that you can buy an annuity later on. I think so there are still a lot of people that would think I've got to choose an annuity now or draw down or wait yep. until that later point. Brilliant. Lovely. OK, then we're going to move it on. And our next most popular question, um, which is really pertinent today, is how much retirement income 
do we actually need to retire on? Um, so, you know, if you are an advisor and you're out there helping people, what is there that you can give them in terms of indication as to what sort of levels of retirement income to, to go for? So I think there's a lot of different thoughts around this out there. I think you see a lot of different, um, I suppose, research papers so is trying to do things like this. So there are a lot of initiatives around, you know, what is what income retirement um, people need? You know, is it set at, you know, half of pre-retirement income? Is it two thirds? There are models that look at whether that counts as sort of the baseline or what would count as a comfortable retirement. And I think it's probably different everywhere you look or slightly different everywhere you look. And not to answer the question by going back to the answer to the previous question again, but of course, a huge amount of it comes down to the client as well. So you could yeah. have people are very high earners, but have very modest retirement goals and things they want to do in their retirement. But you could have people on relatively modest incomes who actually want to almost ramp up in retirement and, and they've got more ambitious ideas for the things that they want to do and want to be able to fund. Yeah, I've got I've got two two sources that, that sort of spring to my mind in answering that question. The first is that the the work that PLSA have done on retirement living standards where PLSA conducted a, a shopping basket exercise and said, what do the various things that the pensioner might want to buy cost? They came up with three different answers for different standards of living, depending on how much you put in your shopping basket of minimum, moderate and comfortable, which were broadly in the range of um, you know, £10,000 a year, £20,000 a year and £30,000 a year. Um, their exercise is a bit more complex than that because you can then add on to that whether the pensioner is living on their, their own. I think those are for figures for single pensioners I gave you so they can ramp it up for a, a couple. It's not twice as much for a couple because you do get some sort of economies of, of scale. But um, you, can, you can ramp that up for that. And again, within those PLSA retirement living standards, you can ramp it up for high cost living areas. So if you live in, in London or the, the middle of Edinburgh, then um, there's a facility to ramp it up for, for that. The other metric which comes to mind is a little bit old now. It's going back to 2005. Some of us will remember um, Adair Turner's Pensions Commission. Um, and Adair said people don't need the old two thirds that people have been aiming for with the sort of classic 60th final salary scheme, but instead suggested that you needed a, a sort of graded percentage of pre-retirement income, which, if I remember rightly, ran from 60% for a high-earning individual up to 80% for a lower-earning individual. Adair's logic being that um, the, the well-off uh, actually have rather more scope to cut back on, on spending when they enter into retirement, whereas those who are, are on lower incomes and, and closer to the, the, the breadline, they're, they're spending sort of kind of cut to the bone already, so they can't cut much, much further back. Um, unless either of you two want to add particularly to that question, Peter. Only one would be uh, mortgages persisting into retirement and, and considering whether that, that's got an, an influence. Over the yes. I mean, I, I, I would say that there are complexities unique to the individual, but um, the simplest thing in the world is to do a realistic, and I'd stress the word, put it in bold, capital, underline it in inverted commas, a realistic income and expenditure analysis. What do you actually expect? And sure, surely, notwithstanding anomalous expenses, capital expenses, that's the way to start. And when it does get complex, many advisors now use cash flow modelling to build some of that complexity in as well. Actually, the PLSA numbers, I think, are a great starting point, but it could be completely wrong for you as an individual. But it's a great starting point in the benchmark. But just what what expenses will you have? I don't. In some ways, it doesn't have to be much more complicated than that. Yeah, Barry, I fully agree with you. I suspect those PLSA benchmarks are more aimed into the um, sort of workplace pension segment um, and an IFA dealing with a wealthier client. Probably you're right. Let's do a shopping basket exercise, work out what they think they're going to spend. And in fact, that exercise could then be refreshed every year and, and go back and, and look at what they did spend um and just how different was it from what they had thought they were going to spend and, and what were the areas of, of overspend or underspend which again would then inform further planning 
going through. Um, I'm going to move us on to our next question. And we have a question which has come in that says, for clients with a low capacity for loss, but a high requirement for income, do we think that CDC, that's the new collective defined contribution, which has just come in with the latest Pensions Act, do we think that CDC will become a means for clients to secure an income for life in the future? Or is that too speculative? Who would like to speculate on the future for CDC as a decumulation vehicle? Well, I think that's the aim of them, isn't it? Um, I haven't really seen the numbers coming out at the end. Uh, I managed to put some up earlier. So maybe, maybe we could compare and contrast and see whether that is a, uh, a competitor to that. To that um, yep, yep. We've certainly seen some of that in the past with uh, people like RSA did a lot of work and said that CDC will deliver higher retirement incomes than sort of other, other sort of retirement vehicles. Mm -hmm. I think the take up will be interesting to see which employers are interested to take it up. That pooling of collective investment risk might well, as you say, create higher ultimate benefits. I'd be interested, I'm, I'm, and I apologise for not knowing more, I'd be interested to know a little bit more about transferring because it might well be that people accumulate within, but then actually choose to decide that the scheme pension structure doesn't really suit their requirements. And actually, they might prefer a, a slightly more flexible retirement decumulation strategy. So you know, what, what's that going to look like? What's going to be the impact of people looking to transfer prior to decumulation? I think it could also be something that, that grows over time. I think in, in terms of how long we've had the pension freedoms and how many people have sort of retired at the moment under the current rules compared to previous, I think it's probably fair to say there's still... A bit of maybe a gap of understanding in terms of people are aware that they've got more flexibility now and they can do that with the dc pensions that's i haven't fully appreciated the loss of the guarantee and the effect of not having sort of the db scheme or annuity um sort of options being used as much as well so it could be something where as people sort of become more aware of the fact that yes they have got the flexibility but they need to take responsibility in some way or they need to sort of replace that guaranteed level and that minimum income that they need, I think that could pick up the popularity as well as that becomes sort of more of a thing that people are aware of. Yes, I mean, I think we, we have to wait for it to become established. I certainly hope it does become established as an important feature in the pensions marketplace. Um, I take Barry's point that it kind of lacks a bit of flexibility. And if you enter a CDC structure in decumulation, you probably won't have much option to change your mind and come out of it again. But um, I think it very much appeals to the sort of British psyche that we would rather be middle of the road than either shooting the lights out or, you know, sort of bringing up the, the rear um, and reducing the risk levels in that way. And I think CDC certainly has a lot to offer somebody that would like to um, have a contented retirement and know that they are, are looked after and will get a reasonable income throughout um, and that they don't need to keep sort of watching the pages of the Financial Times and having a panic attack every time the news says that FTSE's dropped, um, you know, 10% today. If, if, I, if I had one concern, it would be that obviously scheme pension income on the actuary, on scheme actuary's advice can reduce. And so should that happen, the first time that person is receiving this pension, which they understand to be a fixed pension for life indexed, the first time should that reduction actually happen whether it, it might have a significant impact on confidence but that's a very good question Brian. it very much depends upon what they can be persuaded to understand from the outset so i mean royal mail are going in on the grounds that they are expecting that it will be annual increases that the pensioners forego um should the fund not be doing very well and that is your classic cdc model um, if the funds do particularly badly, then of course it's not just increases that are, are foregone. It may be that you have to take a step back and take a, a bit less out. Um, it'll be interesting. Um, if you compare other sectors, uh, building societies, when they've launched into investment products that have risk, never put them in those traditional building society passbooks. 
they said that the customer with the old building society fast book believed that money was always there and could never go down so there is an issue there in terms of whether the cdc pensioner can be conditioned to understand that if things are particularly bad then um, next year's income might be a little less than last year's um i kind of suspect that's tolerable um i think we've all been through phases in life where our employer says to us you need to take a pay cut adrian um and next year's income is a bit less than last year's was and somehow um you know we all managed to get through those so heading on to our next question and the next one with the most votes is if you put some of the portfolio in an annuity can you then afford to take more risks with the other assets um who was looking at a risk there's a related question to this as well which says if you are taking higher risk on some assets should they be the assets inside the pension plan or is it better to take the higher risk with assets that are outside of the pension wrapper um peter can i come to you first particularly on the first part if you put something yeah. in an annuity what do you have to do with the rest of the portfolio well i start by saying we've got to put enough in the annuity <laughs> otherwise it's de minimis and it's of no value but generally yes i think that's the way in which risk is assessed currently so we, we really believe that i'll get off the fence yes <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, Barry and Jess, were, uh, if you put some in the energy, can you take more risk? But also, where would you want to take that risk? Is it better to have your riskier assets in the pension wrapper? Or is it better to have them in the ISA bond GIA wrappers? I think there's a there's a practical issue when it comes, if you, if you have, more, and I would stress again, most of us don't need more than an ISA and a pension, but if you have multiple tax wrappers, there's a practical issue about holding different, component parts of the portfolio in different tax wrappers because if you have a portfolio asset allocation of a fixed amount and you've put all of your equities for example in your pension when your portfolio shifts and you need to do the reallocation how do you get money out of your general investment account without incurring a cgt liability how do you get money out of the investment bonds without incurring chargeable event gains so i think there are practical issues associated with holding different components within different tax wrappers I'd not really consider it in terms of risk. What I would say, if, if you are in an, uh, an ability to, to hold different assets within different wrappers, it might be focused more around the income issue. So, for example, uh, dividends. You know, if, if Barry Foster Limited pays a dividend, it's been paid out of Barry Foster Limited net profits. So when Jessica List pension provider receives it, you know, that's it, that's it. And if, if Adrian Investment Bond receives it even though you're liable to corporation tax your liability is covered by the corporation tax i have paid so for example a really good place to hold dividend yielding assets is an onshore investment bond because there's no further tax within the corporate within the corporate structure of the onshore bonds and yet you still get your basic rate tax credit when you surrender it so that's a really tax efficient way and and with savings it might be rather than paying corporation tax on savings income within an investment bond or a GIA, you might want to hold that within an ISA or a pension. But again, all subjects to my original comment, how do you how do you manage that as the portfolio shifts and you need to rebalance? Yeah, lovely. Um, Jessica, final comment from you, the risky assets, which are the uh, tax baskets, would you put those in? Yeah, I don't think I've got too much to add on that from, from what Barry said. I think it's, you said it's about looking at the consequences of each wrapper and you said what, it makes sense to do in in which place depending on so how that's going to work out and as barry said it it depends on the client as well with i suppose with all of the questions that we've answered you know if you've got just a pension or you've got just a pension so then that's going to make it a lot easier to sort of look at the consequences and compare that than if you've got a range of different tax wrappers that have got a lot of different potential consequences and moving parts lovely thank you um it falls to me to wrap up now um, I will just answer one final question which popped up in the list, which is, is this webinar available afterwards? And the answer to that is yes. Um, it takes about 60, 90 seconds after the end of the webinar and it will reformat itself and be available as a live download. If you want to just 
sit on the screen, you'll see it will come up in about 60, 90 seconds. Alternatively, the same link that you logged in um, this morning, that same Crowdcast link will take you back when you come back again to the replay of the webinar and by all means come back and, and watch it all again or you know let some of your colleagues know that um, you watch something you enjoyed at lunchtime and this is the link that they can take to it. Um, I just want to remind people that the next webinar in our series is again lunchtime 12 o'clock on Thursday the 24th of June and by popular request, we will be coming back to the SaaS marketplace. If you were with us last month, um, we had run through a number of SaaS questions. There were still lots in that ask a question box. There's a great hunger for people to know about SaaS. SaaS is a market which started, gosh, way back in 1973, but has seen a real resurgence um, you know, during the pandemic as people value the flexibilities and the additional ways to access money in a pension plan that SAS offers. So we'll be back with SAS again next month. And in the meantime, I will just thank our, our three presenters. So thanks to um, Barry and Peter and Jessica for giving up your time and coming to um, you know present and answer the audience's questions. And it's time to say cheerio, everyone. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye.